Hello, in this podcast, we're learning how water pollution is controlled. And our learning targets are to understand how to prevent and control water pollution, and also to describe how wastewater is treated. And the main thing to keep in mind when it comes to water pollution is the old saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. In other words, preventing the water from becoming polluted is much, much cheaper than cleaning up the polluted water. And a good example of this, you can sort of see in this picture that you see here of the gas station. This is a gas station in Great Neck, New York. It is abandoned, and the owners there quickly abandoned it because the gas tanks that were storing the gasoline had a leak, and so they quickly left town. Fortunately, ExxonMobil, which was the company at the gas station, is responsible for cleaning it up, but nothing right now is being done. But in addition to this gas station, there are hundreds of gas stations on Long Island that have ruptured tanks. And they leak a carcinogen called MTBE that goes into the groundwater. Towns in Long Island get their drinking water from the groundwater. So that is a serious problem. The only way to treat this water is actually to pump the groundwater out, treat it, and then pump it back in profoundly expensive, and the estimated cost for Long Island is $30 billion, much, much cheaper to make sure the underwater gasoline tanks would not have leaked. The other sign that you see here also comes from uncontaminated water. I believe this was from mercury poisoning in Tennessee. But another major problem in Tennessee is a place called Oak Ridge, which is a super fun site, which we'll learn about uh, later, not in this podcast, though, uh, even though this does have to do with water pollution. The groundwater at Oak Ridge is contaminated with radioactive material from the Manhattan Project, which is from the development of the nuclear bomb. And it still is contaminated today. And they're in the process of doing the same type of thing of both pumping up the water, treating it and pumping it back in, and also digging up the contaminated soil and putting it in a relatively safe landfill. Now, the regulations and laws have protections in place, they enforce them, and that is what helps keep our drinking water and all other waters in, in our nation safe. And you need to know most of these. The most important one in terms of water pollution is the Clean Water Act of 1972, as well as the modifications of that. Like 1977, there are, you've got amendments of it where they strengthen controls and toxic pollutants and the, well, the Water Quality Act of 1987. Another one that goes into this in terms of toxic waste sites is Superfund, which is the nickname of CERCLA. Superfund is only peripheral to this. We learn more, more about that when we learn about hazardous waste. And source reduction is the cheapest way. The ounce of prevention is worth a pound of pure. Road salt is a major problem for organisms living in the soil. And if you use less road salt, that can be done without reducing the safety of cars in the road. Oil is a major problem too. There are quite a few people who will do their own oil changes on their cars, which is fine. But what isn't fine is when they just simply take that used oil and pour it down in the street. What they can do is just bring it to any mechanic, any gas station where they do work, and that stuff will be recycled. Also, recovering metals from industrial waste and selling them. Batteries all contain these very poisonous metals that can get into the soil and and cause quite a bit of damage and batteries can be re and batteries should be recycled and not just simply thrown into the garbage in general things which conserve the soil things which conserve erosion also help protect water quality we'll see that later in this podcast similarly in urban areas reducing materials that are carried away by storm runoff is helpful for non-point sources and land management, now with main causes of non-point pollution, these are things which are spread out rather than something coming out of a pipe. Would be things from agricultural, urban runoff, construction sites, and land disposal. Fertilizer choice has a major point. This top photo that you see over here, this is a chemical fertilizer, and this chemical fertilizer very easily leaches away, so that itself can cause nutrient pollution. Now, on the bottom one you see here, this is an organic fertilizer. So this organic fertilizer is one that binds to the soil. So it doesn't leach away easily. So in terms of water pollution, the organic fertilizer is a much, much better choice than the chemical fertilizer. But when it comes to grazing animals, even when it comes to a farmer using chemical fertilizer, vegetative buffer zones can 
help prevent the nutrients from going into the streams and can help uh, reduce that dead zone that we saw in the last podcast in lakes and in the Gulf of Mexico. These vegetative buffer zones will keep all these things from going into the stream. Also, a fence can keep the cattle away from the stream because they will destroy the vegetation that's along the, the, the shore by trampling the shore. And they will also poop and pee into the stream, which directly adds nutrients there. And that will itself cause the cultural eutrophication. Pesticides itself, pesticides is a poison. You're spraying your field and you want to kill the pests that affect you. If it goes into a lake, if it goes into a river, that will kill non-pest insects and other species. And so ways to reduce that is you only apply the pesticides when you need it or you use IPM, Integrated Pest Management. And if you remember, that's where several different methods are combined and it includes physical methods, chemical methods, and biological methods. Feedlots are what you see pictured over here. These over here, as you can imagine, they produce a huge amount of waste. Feedlots themselves can produce as much waste as a city. And you can prevent the water pollution by planting buffers. You can locate them away from steep slopes, surface water, and flood zones. Okay, now we come to human waste. How is human waste treated? Originally, there was this method here, using an outhouse or a privy. I've had the misfortune of having to use that because when I've gone hiking, that's what they've used in a Outhouse basically is just a toilet put over a hole in the ground. Problem with this, of course, is that if there are too many of those, it just overwhelms the system and all the nutrients and the bacteria that are in the poop will go into the soil and that can contaminate the drinking water and can cause diseases like cholera. Now, the pollutants in raw wastewater, it's almost entirely water. Only 0.1% of it is waste. And these pollutants are debris and grit. There's particulate organic material, colloidal and dissolved organic material. There's dissolved inorganic material and harmful bacteria. There are more than 500 pathogenic bacteria, viruses, and parasites that can travel from human or animal excrement through water. Natural processes will normally break those things down. It's a normal thing for um, out in the wild for animals to defecate and urinate and these normally break things down and it's, an, and it's an actual process of the ecosystem. There are plenty of organisms like flies where eating feces is actually a part of the life cycle like the, the larvae of flies, maggots, larvae of some species of flies which are called maggots depend on feces. They live in the feces. But when you have a large population, these natural processes just don't work. So there has to be a different process. Feces have been used as fertilizer. Human and animal waste has been used, but the problem with that is it can cause disease because there's harmful bacteria in them. Now, until about 50 years ago, most rural areas in the United States depend on outhouses and that contaminated the drinking water. And development of septic fields, which clean water by aeration and removing excess nutrients through bacterial action, Solids are then pumped out and taken to a treatment plant. And I'll show you more details on that right here. Here is a picture of a septic system. The inside the house is just like a normal everyday house. And basically the water that comes out goes into a septic tank. And you see that it's pictured over here where the stuff comes out. The solids will settle down to the bottom and they end up with oils and gas and scum that's on the top. And the liquids will then come out at the same rate that the liquids come in, so the level stays the same. And when the liquids come out, they go out into a field that's filled with uh, either sand or gravel. Their microorganisms will break down the solids. Now, the septic system is intended for individual homes. So you've got those two parts that you saw in there. The septic tank solids fall, fall to the bottom, grease and oil rise to the surface. Must be emptied, some people say, every year. And then you've got that drain field or leach field where the waste drains out of pipes into the soil. The soil filters the pollutants and the bacteria decompose the biodegradable materials. The area should be filled with grass and usually the grass does very well because you've got such nutrients there for them to grow on its natural fertilizer. For cities, New York City has something called a combined sewage system. And that means that the storm drains and toilets use the same pipes and are treated in the same treatment plants. Advantage of that is that both the waters get treated. The problem with it is that the, during heavy rains, the sewage treatment plants are overwhelmed so that a lot of raw sewage then gets dumped into the river or the bay. What's better and what is done in the newer cities would be 
to separate systems where the storm drain system is completely separate from the sewage system and the storm drain system dumps directly into the ocean or river or bay and the sewage goes to a sewage treatment plant. And here's a picture of a sewage treatment plant. And as we go through, I'll show you short videos of the different parts. And here we have a diagram showing all the different parts. It's everything types of treatment that the sewage has to go through. Primary treatment, which is physical. There's secondary treatment, which is biological. Disinfection, which is chemical. Tertiary is both physical and chemical. First, primary. First order of business is to remove debris. This is called a headworks building. It's uh, where the sewage enters the treatment process, and it's coarse screening takes place here, where we remove larger items, bricks, bottles, or anything else that happens to get into the sewer. If you can get it through a maintenance hole in the street, it'll end up here. The material is collected in this trough, ground up, and compressed to remove excess water. The remainder gets loaded into hoppers that are emptied into trucks, and it's off to the landfill. Step removes small rocks, pieces of glass, and sand, known as grit. We separate it in these machines, put it on a conveyor belt, drop it into a hopper again, and then it is collected and hauled to the same landfill. That was just the beginning. Now it's time for the real treatment process. This is called primary treatment. The water comes out of our headworks through our grit collection system, through a control gate, and then passes slow the water down again. And we do that to settle solid material out, primarily fecal material and other solids, foods from kitchens, all of that type of material we want to settle out, take out of the waste stream, and then process it again. Each of the primary tanks is 300 feet long, 20 feet wide, and 15 feet deep. Inside is a collection system made up of scrapers attached to chains the scrapers move along the tank floor and push the settled solid material toward pumps to remove it for processing. Then the scrapers come around and skim the floating grease and lighter material off the top toward the other side of the tank, also for collection. The scrapers and water move at a very low rate of speed. The solids, we call it sludge, is a light, fluffy material, and it just will bellow up and uh, go right over the flight, and you won't be able to move it at all. Now, the primary, the solids are physically removed. Screens or filters are used to remove large objects. Like, for example, in some of these combined sewage systems, they'll be, depending on the time of day, and, actu and actually pe workers in sewage treatment plant, they can tell the time of the day just simply by looking in the primary treatment plant because the the waste that's in the sewage changes by the time of the day. And then there's a settling tank where just simply the water just sits there and the sludge or the solid material will then sink to the bottom and the fat all at the top and they're skimmed off. And what you see pictured over, over here, that's the settling tank. Nothing you saw in the video that is not pictured here is that belt what happens there is that it catches the smaller stuff on the belt and the water just sinks right through. Now, secondary. The secondary treatment process starts in these sealed underground tanks. The water from the primary stage comes here. This bacterial culture and consumes most of the remaining organic material. Once the little critters have had their dinner, it's their turn to be taken out of the mix. And what we do here is we settle the solid material out that's remaining and the biomass that consumed that sewage. After all the processing, we've removed 98% of the material that entered this treatment plant in the sewer systems. This is not drinking water standards, but it is treated into the ocean. For all of the technology involved in the process, the end result can sometimes be gauged by a simple observation. It's a good indicator of, of your treatment process. If you have poor treatment, the seagulls won't go near the water. Secondary is a biological process where the bacteria digest 90% of the organic waste. Uh, there are two ways this is done. One is a trickle filter bed where the effluent, which is liquid from the primary treatment, is sprayed on the stone field. And there's bacteria there, and that bacteria digests the organic waste. 
Second is an aeration plant where there's oxygen added and the oxygen will increase the bacteria's activity. The effluent is added and then there's sludge from the primary treatment and also second settling tank that provides the bacteria and that digests the waste. The settlement tank is similar to the very first one where the water just set. So the effluent settles and some of that settled sludge returns to the aeration tank. And the rest of the sludge is dried, is put in the landfill, or is used as fertilizer. Remember the solids that were collected from the primary and secondary phases? They're pumped into these digesters, where another bacterial culture is introduced, this time in a completely airless environment, heated to 128 degrees Fahrenheit. process of digestion, the bacteria consume the solid material, reduce the bulk, and produce methane gas as a byproduct. We collect the methane gas, compress it, and then ship it to the power plant next door in exchange for energy. We produce enough methane gas to exchange for 17 megawatts of electricity every day. Without this gas to energy exchange, this plant would cost about $12 million a year and reduce the amount of gas every day that we produce would cost about $4 million a year for electricity. Even ancient cultures knew that human waste contains valuable nutrients that help crops grow. So there's one final step of the resource recovery system at Hyperion. Digested sludge from the digesters is pumped through pipelines to this facility called the biosolids dewatering facility. Here, the sludge is similar to the spin cycle in a washing machine. It's dewatered, treated, and sent off to be used as fertilizer. And then the water gets disinfected because uh, there's a lot of nasty pathogens in there. And methods of disinfection would be chlorine, UV radiation, and ozone. And then there's tertiary sewage treatment. This removes the nitrates and phosphates to prevent cultural eutrophication. And then that cleaned effluent is dumped into the waterway. In New York City and a lot of other places, the effluent is cleaner than the river or the bay, but it's not up to the standards for drinking. Another way of treating wastewater is to have a wetland wastewater treatment. This is construct wetlands. This does just a secondary treatment rather than an aeration plant. The primary treatment is the same. It's much less expensive. You'll see about this in this next video. Constructed wetlands are simple wastewater treatment systems. They consist of shallow tanks filled with a gravel layer and planting with emergent rooted wetland plants, such as the common reed. These plants are well adapted to live in flooded conditions found in wetlands. As the wastewater flows through the gravel and the roots of the reeds, Pollutants are progressively removed. Wetlands are constructed so that the wastewater flows below the gravel layer. This results in the absence of mosquitoes and bad odors. To observe the wastewater flowing through the constructed wetland, it is necessary to dig a hole in the gravel. This also allows us to observe the roots of the reeds. It is in this environment of roots and gravel that the wastewater is treated. Here, pollutants are removed by physical, chemical, and microbiological processes. The roots and gravel form a media ideally suitable for the growth of bacteria. It is these microorganisms which contribute most to pollutant removal. Constructive wetlands do not require as many components as conventional wastewater treatment plants. They require pretreatment a system for sedimentation of solids, and the wetland itself. Retreatment consists of screens to separate gross solids and plastics. These solids can easily cause obstructions, and thus it is best to separate them from the wastewater. After pretreatment, the wastewater flows to a septic tank where suspended solids are settled by gravity. After passage through the septic tank, the wastewater is partially clarified. As a final stage, the constructed wetland removes the remaining pollutants. Wastewater is fed to the wetlands by means of channels, therefore ensuring a uniform distribution throughout the bed. 
Water flows through the wetland and is finally collected by means of drainage pipes located at the bottom of the basin. Wetland effluent flows out through a swivel pipe that allows control of the water level in the wetland. The effluent from the wetland is very clear as all pollutants have been removed. Therefore, the effluent is suitable for water reuse or discharge into the environment. Also, the effluent must first be exposed to the sun for 20 to 30 days, and the ultraviolet radiation from the sun kills the pathogens. Now, in developing countries, they will sometimes use a hybrid between the septic system and the sewage treatment plants. In urban areas, they cannot use uh, the drainage field, so they have this effluent sewage where they have two tanks. They have a septic tank, which is just like what we saw before. But instead of putting it into a drainage field, it goes into a second tank, an effluent tank, and those contents periodically have to be emptied, and that's then trucked off to a sewage treatment plant. And this whole thing is less expensive than a sewage treatment system. Now we come to our concluding questions. Number one, how is groundwater treated? Number two, which law created a revolving loan fund? Number three, how is pollution from feedlots prevented? Number four, which part of sewage treatment is the sewage broken down biologically? That concludes this podcast, and I'll see you in class tomorrow.